This week's episode of our show has been sponsored by Fables 2, Pirates of the Ethereal Expanse. This second installment in the Fables franchise has you set sail into a magical ocean, taking up your pirate-themed campaign and going out on great adventures in this mystical, magical, almost space-like ocean. We were super excited by the trailer, and you should definitely check it out uh, in the links below, because Pirates of the Ethereal Sea is an amazing blend of high piracy and high magic. I have tried to run several pirate-themed campaigns. I'm a big fan of them, and I gotta say the inspiration here is top-notch. I was really, really excited just watching the trailer and can't wait to see what's in store in these next upcoming chapters. Each fable is broken into six chapters, and you get a new adventure every month to download. They come with everything that you need to run it, including digital maps and tokens and tools. So whether you're playing in person or online, it's a perfect way to have a new campaign to play every six months. And this new Fables adventure is coming on July 1st, so it's not even that far away. So check the links below, watch the trailer. This is definitely one to keep your eyes on. Thanks so much to Fables 2 and Ghostfire Games for sponsoring this episode. Things like this help us do what we do here on YouTube. And now on to this week's episode. Greetings! My name is Monty Martin. And I'm Kelly McLaughlin. And, and we, we are, are the Dungeon, Dungeon Dudes. Dudes. Welcome to our channel where we cover everything D&D, including advice for players and guides for Dungeon Masters. We upload new videos on Tuesdays and Thursdays, so please subscribe to our channel so that you never miss an episode. Today, we are looking at a beginner's guide to playing an evocation wizard in Dungeons & Dragons 5th edition. For any of you who are fans of fantasy, the idea of playing an arcane spellcaster is one that both Kelly and I hold near and dear for, to our hearts, and as new players to D&D, you shouldn't shy away from diving in the deep end and taking up the mantle of the wizard. The Evocation Wizard was my first foray into a long-term character in D&D 5e, and I had a lot of fun blowing things up with dangerous spells, and that's what the Evocation Wizard is all about. Many people say that spellcasters, and in particular wizards, are a little intimidating for new players, and we're here to say otherwise. If you really want to live the fantasy of being able to cast explosive spells on the battlefield and feel like an all-powerful mage, then the Evocation Wizard is going to be a great avenue for you. Today, we're going to dive into how to build and play your Evocation Wizard, starting right away at first level and taking you all the way to fifth level. There'll be lots of things to cover in this video, so let's get rolling. So one of the most important questions to ask yourself when you're getting to designing your character is what is the fantasy that you want to bring to life at the table? Yes, there's a lot of mechanics that we're going to be worrying about, but at the same time, having an idea of the type of wizard that you're going to be playing is important to inspire the themes and choices that you're going to be bringing to life along the way. For me, in my mind, when I think of an avocation wizard, I really imagine the classic archetype of the elven battle mage. The spell slinger who goes, goes to war with a platoon of elven archers and warriors and augments their battlefield by laying waste to the enemies with arcane magic. That is a classic trope, and I'm going to go a little bit of a different direction and play a lowly little gnome who, his days of being a uh, war wizard are over. He's now a reclusive hermit who lives on the outskirts of society, but he's called into action one last time to bring his arsenal of powerful spells back and try to remember all of the things tucked away in his spellbook. So with our concept in mind, now we need to determine our ability scores. Our strength, dexterity, constitution, intelligence, wisdom, and charisma. And as always, there's a lot of different ways that you can generate your ability scores when you're playing games of D&D 5e, whether you're gonna be rolling the dice, using point buy, or some other method. So it's really important that as you sit down and make your character, you talk to your dungeon master before you get into this. And if you are gonna be rolling ability scores, make sure you roll those ability scores in front of your dungeon master. For ourselves, we're going to use the standard array option. These are predetermined numbers that you can find in the basic rules or the player's handbook that are kind of the average that you would usually find when rolling or that you can acquire through uh, point by. They are 15, 14, 13, 12, 10, and 8. But we get to divvy those up as we see fit. The wizard is a primary spellcaster. Mm -hmm. And like all primary spellcasters, the most important stat for us is probably going to be the one used to cast our spells. For the wizard, that's intelligence. So I'm pretty sure both of us are going to put our 15 in intelligence. Absolutely. Now, from there, where you put your ability scores as your wizard really comes down to the other skills and defenses of your wizard. 
As we're going to find out, wizards are very squishy and do not have a lot of hit points and do not have high AC. And sometimes, and well, you can't really do better, you can mitigate the disaster of that. And so this is where I find it's really good to have a good constitution score with at least a plus two modifier. So I'm going to put my 14 there. And I know that I'm going to be playing an elf, so I'm going to get a boost to my dexterity. So I'm going to put my 13 there as well. I'm going to dump my strength and give myself a good plus one bonus in charisma and leave my wisdom at 10. Now we're going to get to the racial selections in a second, but the race that you choose gives you additional bonuses to your ability scores. Because I happen to already know that I want to play a gnome, I know that I'm going to be getting a plus one to my constitution. So I'm actually going to put my second highest stat, my 14, in dexterity. With dexterity, my ability to dodge incoming area of effect attacks or be a little bit more nimble or quick or get that increase to my AC is going to be important. So dexterity is a very important stat for me. I'm gonna put my 13 in constitution, which again is gonna go up thanks to being a gnome. I'm gonna dump my strength by giving my eight to, to that stat. And then I'm going to give myself a decent wisdom with 12. And I'm going to be mildly capable of handling conversation with a 10 in charisma. I've mostly just been talking to myself most of these years though. <laughs> Both of us are pretty feeble uh, wizards, though, with the 8 in strength. You really get nothing as a wizard from your strength score, and so that's where the 8 lives. <laughs> now again, our races are going to be impacting these ability scores. For myself, I chose a gnome. As a gnome, I'm going to be gaining a plus two to my intelligence and a plus one to my constitution. These are the exact stats that I want for playing a wizard. I get to play a high elf, so I get a plus one bonus to my intelligence score and a plus two bonus to my dexterity score. As a result, I'm going to end up with a dexterity of 14, just like Kelly. We're both going to have a constitution of 14, and Kelly will have the intelligence of 17, where mine will only be 16. All that time spent being a hermit reading books has made me a little bit smarter than the average uh, elf, I guess. Now, at this stage, we'll both want to take note of our other racial traits. Since I'm playing a high elf, I will get some weapon proficiencies, I'll get proficiency in perception the perception skill, the fey ancestry trait, and most notably, I will get to learn an extra cantrip from the wizard spell list. Bonus. I'm going to say that choice though for when I actually choose the rest of my cantrips. As a gnome, I get a really cool ability called Gnome Cunning. I now have advantage on saving throws against spells that require an intelligence, wisdom, or charisma saving throw. It's amazing. Gonna Such be a really good handy. Trait. Yeah. So my gnome is not only a little bit smarter, I may not get the extra cantrip, but I'm better at resisting magic than Montius. Both our characters have dark vision, but we will want to take note of our speed. Being a gnome, I'm a little bit slower than Monty's character. With our ability scores set and our race chosen, now let's get down to choosing our skills. So as an elf, I already get proficiency in the perception skill, so I'm going to note that down on my character sheet. But we also get to choose two other skills, including Arcana, History, Insight, Investigation, Medicine, or Religion are our choices here. We get to pick two of them, and we'll also be getting two more skills from our background choice for a total of four skills, or five in my case, because I get perception. Now is a good time to think about the background that you're going to choose. We'll talk about that in a second, but you'll want to keep that in mind because there's no point picking skills that you're going to gain from your background. So keeping both of these aspects in mind, what skills are you going to choose and what background are you going to choose is going to be important. For myself, I already have an idea on the type of character I'm playing. I know what skills I'm going to gain from that. So I'm going to pick up Arcana and History. Again, I picture my character has been spending many years secluded in the woods reading books. So they know everything there is to know about the history of the world and the magic of the world. I imagine that my character actually went to an elven magical academy and has learned arcana and history from books in a school, but that's going to come from my sage background that I'm going to choose for my character. So I'm going to pick up investigation and insight because my character was trained in problem solving and solving kind of battlefield problems as well. For my character, I'm going to be choosing the hermit background, which is going to gain me religion and medicine as well. A lot of intelligence-based skills here, but that's going to be great for my high intelligence character. Both of our backgrounds give us some extra language choices. In Kelly's case, you also get proficiency in the herbalism kit, which is pretty fun. And so from here, we'll want to actually start tallying up what our skill bonuses are. 
As first level characters, we have a plus two proficiency bonus. So each of the skills that we've chosen to be proficient in, we note that on our character sheet, we mark that we're proficient, and we total up our bonus as two plus the ability score for that relevant ability. So for example, both of us are proficient in Arcana, and we both have an intelligence modifier of plus three. So our Arcana bonus is gonna be plus five. We'll go through the rest of the skill list, noting that all down. So the other knowledge skills like history or even investigation or religion, we're gonna have plus five bonuses there. For the other skills, maybe not as good. My perception and insight will be plus three because of my plus one wisdom modifier. And our athletics are gonna be minus one because <laughs> we're not very strong. No, no. Do we? Did either of us take any dexterity, strength, or charisma related skills? No. No. So no bonuses there, just the straight up ability mod. Next, we're going to want to determine our hit points. The calculations for your hit points are right in the chapter about wizards and each class gets this sort of calculation. For ourselves, it's going to be a D6 plus our constitution modifier. At first level, you get the maximum amount. So for us, that's going to be eight. Eight hit points. A good hit from a longsword or longbow will take you out in one hit. <laughs> Don't get hit. Get behind your fighters and paladins and let and, them and take hide. the hits. Yeah, yeah. How about those saving throws? We do get some decent saving throws, though. We have proficiency in intelligence and wisdom saving throws. Now, this may not save you from dodging out of the way of dangerous attacks, but against spells, this can be really handy, especially if you're a gnome and uh, you have extra advantage on those saving throws. How about that AC? Well, we can't wear armor as a wizard, so you're going to be relying again on hiding behind the big meat shields while you cast spells. Now, even without armor, we still get to add our dexterity to the base armor class, which is 10. For both of us, we have a plus two modifier in dexterity, so our AC is 12. Also, luckily, when we get to our spell selections, there are a few ways to help us out here. But before we get to spells, we do have to choose our gear. Both of us are going to start off with a spell book, and we will have our uh, option of, of choosing a spell component pouch or an arcane focus. What kind of arcane focus are you going to have? I actually like the idea of a pouch. Oh, really? For, for your character, yeah? Now, the way that I like to imagine it is I already have all the bits and bobs in my pouch. I just like to use this as a role play option so that when I'm casting my spells, I can describe pulling out the bit of bat guano and chucking it towards my enemies as it turns into a fireball. I use the pouch not to actually keep a tally of what I need, but I use it in the same way I would a focus. Mm. Usually my DM allows this. I don't have to collect things. I just get to use it to inspire role play. I am going to take a wand. I think that, that this is the classic evoker trope. I hopefully eventually will get a wand of fireballs. Maybe even I'll dual wield wands. Doesn't give me any benefit, but it does give you a lot of style points. <laughs> I do still want to be a wizard with a staff, and being the yeah. hermit self I am, I'm going to take the quarter staff as a gnarled stick that I walk around with. Sort of, I'm imagining almost a Yoda type gnome character. <laughs> the quarter staff isn't as associated with my spell casting as the pouch of components is. We can also take an Explorer's Pack or a Scholar's Pack. And while you might have weapons with your character, there's really not much to say about them from there. <laughs> no, if you stab somebody with a dagger instead of casting a cantrip, you've made a terrible mistake somewhere. Now, I am an elf, so I am proficient with some ranged weapons like longbows and shortbows. And if I get my hands on one, it can sometimes be worth using it at low levels of play. Sometimes those weapons can do a little bit more damage than the attack cantrips, but I'm not going to worry about that. I'm going to stick to my spells. Speaking of which, the main meat of our wizard is going to be your spell selection. Now, spell casting can be a little bit confusing for new players. If you want to get into the gritty details of spell casting, we actually have an entire separate video that goes into great detail on it right up over there. Wizards also have a massive spell list. There are hundreds of spells to choose from over several different source books that have been published for 5th edition. So we have created several guide videos discussing the spells of 5th edition and we strongly recommend you check them out. But we are going to get into the basic recommendations that we would recommend as you're leveling up as some first spells to try out as you're making your wizard. The key thing to know here when it comes to our spells is there's a few different components. 
First of all, we obviously want to make sure that we know our spell saving throw DC and our spell attack modifier, as these numbers will be used by many, many of our spells, especially as evokers. We'll also need to choose our cantrips, and then from there we'll need to select what spells we're going to put into our spell book and figure out how to manage that, and then deciding how we're going to go about preparing spells. There's a few different steps here, so we're going to go over it one at a time. Let's start simple by determining our spell attack bonus and our spell save DC. Your spell attack bonus is used whenever you cast a spell that requires an attack roll. You roll the d20 and you add your spell attack bonus to it. In our case, it's going to be our intelligence modifier plus our proficiency bonus. So that is going to be three plus two, which is plus five. For our spell save DC, every time that we cast a spell that requires a saving throw, our enemy needs to roll a d20, add the appropriate modifier, and try to match or get higher than our spell save DC. The calculation for this is the same as our spell attack modifier, but you add an additional eight. I like to imagine that it's eight because there are eight schools of magic. That's my easy way to remember. So for us, it's going to be 13. You'll want to note these down front and center on your character sheet because you'll be referring to these all the time. From there, let's choose our cantrips. Cantrips are simple spells that your character can cast at will. Every time it's your turn, you can use one of these. You don't have to track how many uses they have. You never run out of them. It's simple magic that you can do all the time. And cantrips are great because they give us the bread and butter attack spell that we can use on our turn, either when we want to conserve spell slots or if we're out of spell slots, or because the battle isn't dangerous enough to merit using them. So we get to choose three cantrips. I get a bonus one because I'm a high elf. So which cantrips would you recommend to start off with? I'm a fiery guy. My evocation wizard likes to burn things, and so I'm going to go with Firebolt as my main attack cantrip. Now, one thing to keep in mind as we're selecting our cantrips and spells, you may be an evocation wizard. So there's going to be a focus on evocation and doing some decent damage. But you should always keep in mind the other spells. All wizards have access to the entire spell list, and there are many non-evocation spells that are worth looking at. For cantrips, I really love looking at Mage Hand and Minor Illusion as my other two choices. Yeah, there's a lot of other combat-focused evocation cantrips, but I feel like I only really need one to rely on. I really like your choices, but I think that you're going to run into a problem if you had have, have to fight a Fire Elemental or a Red Dragon. Yes, I so am. So I'm going to use my bonus cantrip to take Ray of Frost. And that way I've got Frost and Fire, so my bases should be covered in most cases. As we level up, we will get a few additional cantrips, so I might want to consider a couple other damage types, bringing those into my arsenal as well. In both cases, Ray of Frost and Firebolt use an attack roll when we cast it, so we're going to be using our spell attack bonus. So whenever we make an attack with these spells, we roll a d20, add 5, and try to beat the AC of our opponent. So now let's get into the whole mess that is wizard spellcasting. This is the thing that often trips up new players, but here's an easy way to break it down. As a wizard, you have three lists that you need to be thinking about. The wizard spell list, which is all the spells that wizards have access to in the entire game. And then from that list, you're going to be choosing spells or finding them on your adventures to add to your spell book. So your spell book represents what your character knows of the massive selection of spells that exist in the entire game. You can only prepare and cast the spells that you have recorded in your spell book. So when you are preparing your spells at the start of the adventuring day, you're gonna look at that spell book list and then make a smaller list of the spells that you wanna prepare. So it's kind of like you're taking a little bit of a one bucket, putting it into the next one, then taking a little bit out of that, putting it into the final one. So you're kind of filtering things down each time. So from this massive hundred spell list that wizards get, you get a little, little selection. This can be really confusing for new players, but generally speaking, the wizard spell list is all the spells that every wizard in the entire world knows. But not every wizard knows all the spells. They need to study. Your spell book is sort of your menu. If the entire spell list is all the food options in the world, your spell book is the menu at your own personal restaurant. What options are available to you? But you can't always order everything on the menu, so your prepared spells 
are your orders that you are ready to eat that day or cast. And think of these spell slots as the number of plates you've got to divvy things out with. As a first level wizard, we get to choose six spells to pack into our spell list. But then we get to choose of those six, a number of spells equal to our wizard level plus our intelligence modifier, which in this case is four. So basically we're gonna look at that entire wizard spell list, pick six of the first level spells, put those in our spell book, and then every day we're gonna read our spell book, choose four of the spells from the spell book to prepare, and then we have two spell slots, which can be used to cast any of those four spells in any combination. Being an evocation wizard, I want a few evocation spells. So out of the six that I'm gonna put in my spell book, I'm definitely gonna want Burning Hands. Yeah. But I also think Earth Tremor has some fun implications. And Magic Missile is a great choice for an evocation wizard. Why? Because you don't even need to roll to hit with Magic Missile, it just does it. Now, those are my evocation choices, but again, you want to look at the broad spectrum of spells available to you and choose some that are going to help out in other instances. Ice Knife is not an evocation spell, but it is a great damage dealing spell and it really fits the sort of blowy uppy damagey vibe that I have going on here. I also really love Find Familiar so that I can have a pet to bring along with me, and Mage Armor, which is going to help with my AC problem and make me a little tougher on the battlefield. I think those are some great picks. For myself, I also took Magic Missile and Find Familiar. I think every wizard worth their salt who wants to have both those spells. But I'm also going to pack Detect Magic because I like to investigate magical phenomena around. And for my damage dealing spells, I'm going to take Tasha's Caustic Brew and Thunder Wave. Um, I really like these s small area of effect spells and Tasha's Caustic Brew is a great one because once they get hit by it, enemies have to take an action to scrape the acid that's slowly dissolving them off. For my defensive spell, I'm going to choose Shield. Mage Armor is a little bit hard to use at first level because you have to commit to using it right away at the start of the adventuring day and now boom, half your spell slots are gone. I'm going to bring Shield in case there's an emergency and then that way I don't have to decide to use it until I actually need it. Keep in mind that most of the spells we talk about are going to be found in the player's handbook or the basic rules. However, we might mention a few, like Monty's choice of Tasha's Caustic Brew, that were added in later books. Talk to your DM about which books you're using and which ones are available to you so that you can choose from the spells available. Now, it's also worth noting as we go to prepare our spells that as a wizard, as long as some spells have the ritual tag, which means that instead of using a spell slot to cast them, we can simply spend an extra 10 minutes casting them and cast them without expending a spell slot at all. But in addition to this, we don't even need to have the spell prepared. It just needs to be in our spell book. So two of the spells that we took that include this are both Detect Magic and Find Familiar. So when we're preparing our spells, we don't ever need to prepare these, but we can still cast them even though we haven't prepared them by casting them as a ritual. So for me, Detect Magic and Find Familiar are two of my six spells. So I'm just gonna prepare Shield, Tasha's Caustic Brew, Thunder Wave, and Magic Missile. And there's my four prepared spells. Monty thought this out a little bit better than me. I only have one ritual spell, which is Find Familiar, meaning that I have five spells to choose from that I need to prepare in order to cast, but I only get to pick four of them. So I'm going to go with my whole list, and actually for now, I might leave out Magic Missile. How dare you? I know, it's, it's a little blasphemous, but I really like Ice Knife and I wanna see what I can get out of Earth Tremor. But the good news is that every time I take a long rest, I can refinagle which spells I've prepared from my spell book. So if I'm not loving Earth Tremor and it's not being as useful as I want it to be, I can always, during a long rest, say, okay, Earth Tremor, I'm forgetting you and I'm gonna study Magic Missile to prepare it for the next day. And of course, between your adventures, if you find a scroll or another wizard spell book, you can take that spell book and during your downtime, copy spells from that book into your own spell book. So you don't even need to gain a level to learn new spells if you find them during your adventures. Of course, as we level up though, we will learn two new spells of a level that we can cast every time we gain a level, reflecting our own personal research. So let's go on some adventures and let's level up. Maybe we, we're gonna assume that we're not gonna find any spell books on our adventures, so we're just gonna go for what we're gonna pick as we level up. But your choices might change 
if you find some of these spells along the way. So as we get to second level, our hit points go up to 14. We're going to be able to prepare one extra spell. We get a third first level spell slot and we get to pick two more spells. So what are they going to be for you? For myself, I want another ritual spell, so I'm going to take Identify. Again, my bookworm know-it-all gnome hermit, he can tap into his expanded knowledge to identify any item that he holds for long enough. So the Identify spell is now tucked away in my spell book. I never even need to prepare it. Mm. I'm also going to take Sleep. Not an evocation spell, but really useful at low levels. If you have a group of enemies that are pretty low hit points, you might be able to knock half or all of them out using the sleep spell. I got a plan for the future, and I'm going to take Mage Armor and Absorb Elements myself. I might not start preparing Mage Armor right away because, again, at low levels of play, spending your spell slot on it is a pretty big ask especially if you can play well and avoid just getting hit by hiding behind the Barbarian or the Paladin or the Fighter. I really like Absorb Elements as well, because one of the things that can still get you is when the Dragon decides to breathe fire on both you and the Barbarian that you're hiding behind. And so Absorb Elements will help shield you from some of that damage at least. So I like having those spells in my arsenal because it really gives me that defensive lever, that emergency button that I can slam if I do get hit. So at second level, we also get to choose our school of magic. For us, we're going to choose evocation. That was the plan all along. So now we are officially evocation wizards. By choosing evocation, we gain two unique abilities specific to the evocation wizard. We gain evocation savant and sculpt spells. Every school of magic gains an ability like Evocation Savant specific to their school of magic. This makes it cheaper and faster to copy Evocation spells into our spellbook. There is a cost associated with copying spells from another scroll or spellbook into yours, but if they're Evocation spells, we don't have to worry as much about it. But the main feature that we're going to gain is Sculpt Spells, and this is one of the best features for being an Evocation Wizard. Part of being an evocation wizard is going to be dropping great area of effect spells on a group of enemies. The problem is that usually our barbarians, fighters, paladins, and various other people are going to be running in to the mix with those enemies. Sculpt spells allows us to choose a number of creatures equal to one plus the level of the spell, and those creatures automatically succeed on their saving throws against the spell and take no damage from it. This is going to be really helpful when we drop fireballs on a group of enemies with our Barbarian and Fighter in there. It is important to note, though, that if the spell has other effects that aren't dealing damage or tied to a saving throw, creatures in that area can still be affected by them. So as an example, the higher level spell, Ice Storm, conjures hail and storms that deal damage, but it also leaves behind difficult ground. So if you do have allies in the area, they're not going to be hurt by it, but they're still going to need to deal with the difficult ground that the spell left behind. With that, though, we're ready to start blasting with our evocation spells and gain another level. So moving on to level three, we gain access to second level spell slots. Again, for new players, this might be a little confusing. Level three, second level spells. Luckily, all you need to do is look at the chart listed in the wizard section of the player's handbook or basic rules and it tells you exactly how many of each leveled spell you have by the level that you gain. It's a little confusing because as you gain levels, you're gaining a different level of spell. It's one level spell for every two levels you gain, but it's easy if you can just follow along on the table. In this case, as a third level wizard, we now have four first level spell slots and two second level spell slots. Those new second level spell slots can be used for casting higher level spells or upcasting our lower level spells. We now get to learn two new spells to add to our spell book, so we're going to want to pick some second level spells so that we can start using those spell slots to their best effect. For me, personally, I really love Flaming Sphere. This is not an evocation spell, it's a conjuration spell, but it feels like an evocation spell. You get to conjure up a fiery ball and move it around the battlefield, slamming it into your enemies. It does damage throughout the entire combat, and I really love this because oftentimes I will go into a combat, cast Flaming Sphere, direct that little fiery ball around, and just use my cantrips from there and be doing great damage anyways. 
But I also think it's good to have some utility, and sometimes you need to escape. So I'm going to take Invisibility as my other spell. For myself, I want another evocation spell, so I'm going to take Scorching Ray. This allows me to emit a fiery bolt from my hands, and I get to shoot three of them, mm. which is pretty fun. I can blast the same target three times or blast three different targets. But again, I also like utility, and another spell that I think is great for battlefield control is going to be Web. Web allows me to create an area of effect on the board that is sticky and can trap enemies in my web and let my barbarians, fighters, and paladins have their way beating them to a pulp while they're stuck in the webs. And you can also light those webs on fire. That's it's a, a wonderful combination with Scorching Ray and Firebolt. <laughs> and this is a great way to think about your evocation wizard. Oftentimes, it is really great to combine your spells in interesting ways like this and find out how you can get the most effect from the least number of spells. It can be very tempting as you're playing an Evocation Wizard to simply spend all your spell slots casting Burning Hands over and over again, or Scorching Ray over and over again, and dealing as much damage as you possibly can, but then you run out of spell slots. A better strategy and one to start practicing is using a one big spell that is going to have a big impact for the whole battle. Web and Flaming Sphere will do this. Once you cast those spells, you're concentrating on them. So you can't have another concentration spell in effect, but that spell is going to be something that is going to be changing the battlefield turn after turn after turn. And then from there, you might only need to use your cantrips and maybe another spell slot or two to carry the battle to its conclusion. Remember, you've got allies that are going to do damage as well. So being able to bring in a battlefield effect and then play around that can often be just as effective, if not more, than just casting Burning Hands for the third time in a row. Now, we should also note that at this level, our hit points are going to go up to 20, and that is about all that we gain from this yeah. level. Now, when I say that's all that we gain, wizards don't have a lot of key features that they gain from being a wizard. Most of their whole play is how many spells you can cast and how many you know. So that's a lot of what we're gaining at pretty much every level. But let's move on to level 4. Level 4 is a big level. We get our hit points up to 26 and we get an ability score increase. This allows us to choose two of our ability scores and boost them by one point, or choose one ability score and boost it by two. I'm going to boost my intelligence to 18, giving me a plus 4 intelligence modifier. Now I have an interesting choice to make. I currently have a 17 intelligence, and if I bump it up to 18, I gain a plus one to my intelligence modifier, making it a plus four. But if I bump it up to 19, that actually doesn't gain me anything else. So there's no point putting plus two in intelligence at this moment. But also, most of my other stats aren't really going to benefit from an additional plus one. This is where it might be a great option to choose a feat. Talk to your DM about whether they're allowing feats in your game, and if they are, there are some great feats out there for spellcasters. And also, there are feats that we call half feats that give you a plus one to an ability score and an additional feature. I'm going to use a feat that is found in Tasha's Cauldron of Everything. Again, you need to talk to your DM about which books you're allowing at the table. If you are having Tasha's Cauldron of Everything, I really like Fae Touched and Shadow Touched. For my gnome who's been living out in the wilderness reading books, he has an association with the Fae, so I'm going to take Fae Touched. This allows me to get my plus one to intelligence, putting me now at an 18 and a plus four modifier, but also I gain a few extra spells. I'm going to gain Misty Step automatically, and I get to choose another enchantment or divination spell, and they don't even have to be from the wizard spell list. So I'm actually going to pluck something from the warlock spell list and take <laughs> Hex. This is just going to allow me to Hex my target. If I hit them with my Firebolt, I'm going to be doing a little bit of extra damage. Not only that, but both Hex and Missy Step, I, am, I can now cast once without using a spell slot. So this is almost like adding two extra spell slots that have to be used for those spells. Fey Touched and Shadow Touched are amazing feats at low levels of play, and I strongly recommend considering them for any wizard. It's a real big upgrade for you. Yeah. yeah. We also gain another cantrip at 4th level, and I think I need another damage type, so I'm going to borrow from you your ideas here and take Ray of Frost. 
I am going to diversify even further, and I'm going to dabble in Necromancy and pick up Chill Touch, giving me a third damage type, but also one that is kind of useful even against Undead. With our intelligence going up to 18 and our modifier raising up to plus 4, this means that we have to check our spell attack modifier and our spell saving throw DC. Our spell attack modifier is going to go up to plus 6, 2 from proficiency, 4 from intelligence, and our spell saving throw is going to go up to 14, 8 base, plus 2 from prof proficiency, plus 4 from our intelligence modifier. So we'll want to update our character sheet accordingly, as well as update any of our intelligence based saving uh, skills or saving throws. Those are all going to go up by plus one. Now that we are fourth level as well, we now get to choose eight spells to prepare. And we get to pick two more spells to add to our spell book. I really want to grab Misty Step and Web. You have those. I really like them. I want to have them too. <laughs> They're great choices. Yeah. Focusing in on evocation, I'm going to take Shatter. This is a pretty fun spell that doesn't have to mess around with whether or not I'm doing fire damage, which a lot of my spells are. So this gives me a different damage type. I'm also going to take Mirror Image. Again, I might be a very squishy wizard, but if I can cast Mirror Image and make multiple of me, I'm going to be a lot harder to hit. For deciding how to divvy out your spells, I like to choose to prepare three of the second level spells that I know and four five of the first level spells that I know. This means that I can cast at least each of my second level spells once, or I can cast a cut one multiple times and ignore one for the day. And I've got a few different choices for my first level spell slots. At this level, we have four first level spell slots and three second level spell slots as well. So we've got some flexibility here, but we still are able to prepare more spells than what we have spell slots for. So be careful with that one. Now let's hit fifth level. This is a really important level for spellcasters because you get access to third level spells. Oh yeah, and forget the hit points, they're going up to 32. The only thing we really care about now is getting those sweet, sweet third level spells. We got two third level spell slots, and we get to pick two third level spells to add to our spell book. What are they going to be? Well, there's one choice that I think every evocation wizard needs in their arsenal. It's the most iconic spell in the game game i would argue probably fireball yeah don't mess around with no lightning bolts grab fireball love it you're you can use it so easily because with sculpt spells you can emit four people from being affected by it so you can throw your fireballs with impunity not even worrying about your allies in the area unless you got a really big party now also, we get to choose another spell, and there are some great choices. I think third level is some of the best spells in the game. Absolutely. There are more amazing third level spells than you will have the kind of free picks for. So this is definitely the point where you are going to want to start looking for those other spell books, because I really feel like you're going to want a lot of these third level spells. You're going to want a lot of rituals now as well. we got to catch up on those. But we got to really think about what are going to be the flagship spells that we're going to have for third level. So what are you going to pick? I am trying to decide between whether my second spell choice is either going to be Thunderstep, which is really great. I gained Misty Step from my feat that I chose, which gives me a free casting of Misty Step. But sometimes not only do you want to teleport, but you want to dish out a ton of damage because you're mm. surrounded by enemies. Thunderstep is great for that. But also, I do love some battlefield control, and I think slow is a great spell to pick it's here as well. Incredible spell. I think for myself, the other spell that I would consider here is fly. Taking fly right away at fifth level can be game changing because not only can you use fly on an ally or yourself to protect you in combat, but you can use it for problem solving too. And you'd be surprised at how many situations at low levels of play, especially at fifth level, are just totally solved by being able to fly. And the spell lasts long enough that you might be able to use it for more than one combat encounter or really plan out interesting ways to use it in both combat and puzzle solving. Now, there's one other important thing that happens at fifth level that's gonna make us even more powerful. And that is our proficiency bonus goes up to plus three. This means that every skill that you're proficient in, every saving throw that you're proficient in, all are gonna go up by plus one. Not only that, but because our spell attack bonus and our spell save DC incorporate our, our 
proficiency bonus into them, they both go up by another plus one. So over the last two levels, we just gained a plus two in the power of our spells. Yeah. We're now at a plus seven to hit with our spells and a saving throw DC of 15. Finally, we will be able to prepare nine spells in total because we're fifth level and we have an intelligence modifier plus four. We only know two third level spells right now, so I will prepare both of them. Uh, and then what I like to do is spread around a smattering of the other ones. I find that once you have several levels of spells as an evocation wizard, it's worth considering carefully how many different damage dealing spells you want to prepare and try to think about how they overlap with one another. Fireball does a lot of damage over a huge area, so you might not need to prepare spells like Shatter anymore, or, necess or maybe you might not bring Burning Hands anymore because you don't need another fire damage spell. This is where now Magic Missile can be very useful because now its utility as kind of this precision target never missing spell is really useful because it kind of covers all the situations that fireball just doesn't got an enemy immune to fire damage magic missile got your allies really in the mix or maybe some innocent bystanders magic missile got an enemy with magic resistance or high saving throws magic missile so thinking about how your different damage dealing spells complement one another is a real important thing to playing an evocation wizard well. You don't want to choose too many spells that are close in level that do the exact same thing. Don't make the mistake of packing Fireball, Scorching Ray, Flaming Sphere, and Burning Hands and having Firebolt as your cantrip only to run into a room with uh, some Fire Elementals and a Red Dragon. Yeah. It's not going to go well for you, but Fireball kind of covers our fiery bases. I might still take Scorching Ray, but I might not even be using Firebolt as much. I might be re relying on Ray of Frost mm -hmm. that I took at fourth level. Magic Missile or Ice Knife yeah. are going to allow me to divvy it up. And yeah, you want a few different damage types to deal with different situations. Yeah, and you've got some really interesting combos there in like combining Slow with Ray of Frost to really force enemies to move super, uh, super, super, uh, at that point your enemies are gonna be moving at a crawl. I am a little bit of a combination I find of evocation and battlefield control, which is one of my favorite combinations mm -hmm. for a wizard. And with fly and invisibility, I've got a little bit of utility. So it is useful to think about your evocation wizard as having kind of a side specialization. What are you gonna do aside from damage? Do you wanna have utility? battlefield control, some sort of problem solving or buffing, you might decide to go on the opposite spectrum from slow and take haste to buff up your allies. As you gain levels with your wizard, there's so many more options that open up for you, and you can always mix things up by changing which spells you've prepared and seeking out the spellbooks of your rival wizards to add their knowledge to your own arsenal. And as you're leveling up your wizard, keep in mind that we have videos on great spell combinations, uh, high-level wizard spells, and all sorts of other spellcasting treats. So you can really dig into those videos and find the best spell choices for you. And that's really the fun of the wizard, is you get the full array of spells to choose from, and you can reshape and bend the world to your will. This has been a beginner's guide to building an evocation wizard in Dungeons & Dragons 5th edition. If you're getting started on building your evocation wizard or are playing one currently, tell us how it's going in the comments below. The videos that we create on our channel are made possible thanks to the incredible generosity of our Patreon supporters. If you enjoy our content, please be, be consider becoming a patron of our show by following the links in the description below. And if you want to see some spell casting in action, you should check out our live play in the Worlds of Drakenheim, which airs Tuesday evenings on Twitch. You can find all the previous episodes right up over here. And we have plenty more guides to the classes of D&D 5e right up over here. Please subscribe to our channel so that you never miss an episode. Thanks so much for watching. We'll see you next time in, in the, the dungeon. dungeon.